The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Milby with the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, uh, talking to you from Chicago, Illinois. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, this webinar is called On-Bill Financing, an energy efficiency solution for member-owned utilities in the Midwest. So this webinar will explore the potential of on-bill financing as a tool for member-owned utilities. We'll look specifically at programs developed in Illinois and Kansas and also hear from a regional expert on the subject in South Carolina. This presentation is brought to you in partnership by MIA and EESI, that is the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance and the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, or MIA, is a collaborative network uh, with the purpose of advancing energy efficiency to support sustainable economic development and environmental preservation. MIA was formed in 1999 to bring strategic partners together to improve market conditions for energy efficiency. And currently, MIA has about 150 members across the region. That's the 13-state Midwestern region you see there. EESI, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, was founded in 1984 by a bipartisan con uh, congressional caucus as an independent nonprofit organization, but receives uh, no federal funding. They are a source of nonpartisan information on energy and environment, po environmental policy development. In addition to policy work, EESI provides direct assistance to develop on-bill financing programs. There we go. So today's speakers um, include Lindsay Smith, who is the Vice President of Education at the Electric Cooperatives of so uh, South Carolina, Bob Dickey, the Vice President of Marketing and Economic Development at Eastern Illini Electric Cooperative, and Brian Dryling, the Manager of Energy Services at Midwest Energy in Kansas. So to start off, uh, we're going to kick, kick it off with Lindsay Smith from South Carolina. So, uh, Lindsay directs the Help My House Residential Energy Efficiency Program for South Carolina's independent, consumer-owned, not-for-profit electric cooperatives and the homeowners that they serve. Help My House is 100% no money down loans, bookend energy audits, trained contractors, and easy on-bill repayment served as models for the USDA Energy Efficiency Conservation Loan Program, or ECLIP, and the Rural Energy uh, Savings Program that was included in the 2014 Farm Bill. Thank you so much for joining us, Lindsay, and uh, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Mark. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on which coast you're on, which part of the country you're in. I'm listening to this, uh, uh, honored to be part of this webinar. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about our Help My House program in South Carolina. Uh, I've put my email address there on the, on the title slide at the bottom of the screen. I know we're going to have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of this. But just in case anybody wants to email me directly after with any questions, you're welcome to do so, and I'll put that slide up again. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit first about the co-ops in South Carolina. There are 20 distribution systems in South Carolina. Uh, together, they serve about 1.3 million South Carolinians in all 46 counties. We maintain and operate about 70,000 miles of line in the state and are together the largest distribution st uh, system. Uh, in South Carolina by far. Next slide, please. We do not own generation. Uh, we buy it, mostly from the state-owned power authority called Santee Cooper. 
and we buy it through RG&T, which is Central Electric Power Cooperative. You'll hear more about them in a little bit. Uh, but right now, like uh, other states, uh, and, the and because of the economy in part, we have too much generation in South Carolina. We're overbuilt. And we have two new nuclear units coming online. Uh, Santee Cooper does. They're partners with one of the big IOUs in the state. Two new nuclear units coming online in, uh, uh, within the next five years. Next slide, please. A little bit about our consumers, our, our members. Uh, in general, we are poorer. Uh, the state is hotter. The climate is hotter. We're less efficient in the way we use heat, electricity. Uh, so lots of heat pumps. And um, we're living in poorer housing stock than a lot of other states. Uh, of particular note, that first bullet. Look how much manufactured housing, what many people call mobile homes, trailers, three times the national average. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. I'm going to talk to you today about two Help My House programs. One initially was a pilot based, by the way, I must point out, uh, in large measure on um, the House Smart program in Kansas that you're going to hear about in just a little bit from Brian. Uh, so so uh, props to them for, for doing something that works really well and a model on which we based Help My House, the loan pilot. That pilot, as you see, uh, if you would go back one, Mark, uh, that the main purpose of the pilot was uh, to test energy efficiency versus the cost of asking Santee Cooper and others to build new power plants. Uh, the cost of that, uh, by our, our estimation, is significantly lower for energy efficiency if you invest on a large scale. But we want to test that and test also if consumers would accept a model that we had put together. Um, we used RUS and, and funding from Central Electric. For the first time, we asked uh, the Red Leg program to make a loan for energy efficiency. Uh, and then on the working program side, on the right side of the screen at the bottom, we do have uh, co-ops that have decided after the pilot ended in 2012 to launch their own programs, funded by themselves or, again, by going back to USDA, RUS, and getting Red Leg loans for this purpose. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a little bit more about the pilot. Again, Central Electric, our GNT, established some efficiency goals. Their board did back in 2010 reducing uh, uh, residential energy use, um, wholesale power purchase costs, maintaining, improving member satisfaction. They partnered with us here at the statewide Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina is what that ECSE stands for to design this pilot program. Uh, and uh, also wanted to see if federal legislation might come along to help fund and create a lending pool, a larger lending pool for a larger version of this same thing. Next slide, please. We constructed our uh, on-bill financing program uh, to look a lot like a tariff, although these are loans to members. We got a law passed in 2010 to pave the way for the pilot that says, in South Carolina now, we may tie the loans to the meter, not to the individual homeowner, but to the meter on their home. We do that by virtue of a new document that's, that's kept at the Registrar of, of Deeds called the Notice of Meter Conservation Charge, NMCC for short, Notice of Meter Conservation Charge. So that's a document that it would be in the closing documents at the sale of a home to notify the buyer of that home that they're accepting, they're purchasing not only a home, but also the responsibility for paying off the loan for whatever measures were done to improve the energy efficiency of that home. So it also allows us another important can be disconnected if the member does not pay the loan payment. Uh, the same power that extends to co-ops and utilities for non-payment of electric bills would then extend for non-payment of the loan. It stays with the home if it's sold, as I said, and it eliminates the need, in our mind at least, for credit checks because, again, the loan is to the home. And we'll talk about survivability a little bit more in a minute. Next slide, please. What, what, the model does, what the model does is it allows members to finance energy efficiency measures with those low interest loans, zero down loans. So one of the barriers, as we all know, to members weatherizing homes, buying a new heat pump, insulating, and so forth, is that cost. So one way to do that, again, this is a model that we looked at uh, with Midwest in, in Kansas. Um, go ahead and make a 100% loan and fund it all. 
Uh, they repay these loans on their utility bills every month, so that's a convenient way to do it. And it enables those without the, the, the down payment to go ahead and do those things they've been waiting for years to do. Next slide, please. And you can go ahead and skip to the one after that. This is just to talk some more about the pilot. Uh, we had eight co-ops participate, participate in that pilot. A number of these on the, the list there are now running their own programs, having had a really good experience and having had members who had a good experience in the pilot program. Again, Central uh, Electric, uh, G&T, uh, was the, the, the major player in this. They got the loan, the red leg loan. Uh, they paid for the, the, the cost, the administrative costs. Then we as the statewide had a major role as well. Next slide, please. Other very important stakeholders in the pilot, of course, EESI, which is co-sponsoring this webinar, uh, co-presenting this webinar. Their, their work funded in part by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, a grant to EESI. And then together we all went out and hired ECOVA to come in and help us with operations of our pilot program. Next slide, please. Now this slide speaks specifically to the structure of how the, the program works. Uh, it's the same structure essentially that's being used by the current working program, so it's worth talking about for a minute. You see Central Electric, the G&T at the top left. Uh, they go out and get the money from USDA, and then they lend it to KW Savings. That's a group we haven't talked about yet. I am the CEO of KW Savings. That is a required third-party entity uh, that Red Leg uh, requires uh, in order to for the loan money to flow down to the uh, individual homeowners. Uh, in other words, you can go get these red leg loans, which now the maximum on those is a million dollars each time. But you cannot, as a co-op or um, RUS lender, lend that money directly to your members, pay off contractors. There must be a third party. For us in South Carolina, KW Savings is that third party in between the, the actual borrower, which in this case was central or could be you as a co-op, and your member. So KW Savings goes out and trains um, contractors, acquires BPI auditors. We have one on staff, uh, Building Performance Institute, so certified auditors. It could easily also be ResNet. Um, the account rep and co-op are one and the same. The account rep is at the co-op, although KW Savings can provide that individual as well if the co-op wishes. And then, of course, everything flows to the consumer member. Next slide, please. A little bit more about KW Savings and what we offer. We're an a la carte menu as a third party. Uh, so co-ops can do these things themselves, a lot of them, or they can choose for KW Savings to do them. Uh, we do program management audits, as I mentioned, contractor management, so getting the contractors, vetting them, training them, uh, background screening them. Uh, loan review and processing, we, we have a, a Co-op credit union, as I'm sure many of the folks on the phone do as well, access to that. We use our credit union to do the loan documents and processing. Uh, member support and communications, and of course the other things listed there. Next slide, please. Another important function of KW Savings is setting and maintaining the brand standards for Help My House, which is our program brand. And we want that to be a brand that members begin to associate with quality service, uh, quality controls with a consistent product. So you see the, the, the standards. Every co-op that runs the Help My House program must uh, subscribe to these standards. Quality controls, the bookend audits, front end of the job, back end of the job, loan documents either drafted by us or vetted by the, the, the co-op, I mean by the credit union. Uh, data collection, we want to continue to collect data. How are the homes performing? Before the, ad, the, the uh, additions and, and, and improvements, how were they historically performing, and then how are they performing once we're done? Uh, and then, of course, sharing a business plan to indicate how you're, as a co-op, going to run the program. Those are, those are things we insist on as, as the brand managers. Next slide, please. How do you get your people? Well, how do you get members to sign up for this thing? Well, sometimes they select themselves. So high bill complaints are a source of participants as are um, billing records, going back in and, and finding folks you think, based on what you know of the, the account and the account holder and the home, who might be a good candidate. At that point, when you've made your sort of list up, you go and you do visual audits, visual inspections. How old is the home? How much 
Uh, how many gaps around the doors and windows? What's the insulation of the attic look like? That sort of thing. If, if the house passes muster at that point, you're doing a full-on audit with a blower door and duct blaster. You're generating numbers from those tests that you put into a computer software, and you determine whether or not you can save that homeowner, homeowner enough each month to more than cover their projected loan payment each month. If you can, the home qualifies for our program. It has nothing to do with the, the member's credit rating, although I will say each of the co-ops participating looks at billing records at a minimum, and at least one of our co-ops has chosen to do credit scoring instead of a, a base score, so some options in there. Then there's the loan approval and contractor selection. The contractor selection is up to the member, to the homeowner. We give them a list, and they pick. Uh, once they do that, the contractor comes in, installs the measures. We come in back behind when the job is done, do another blower door duct blaster. The contractor must have hit the targets and quality measures that we um, uh, require. If they have, if they have not, they must come back and redo anything that was not done properly. Next slide, please. A little bit about the measures that we installed in the pilot itself. These are fairly consistent with if we were to, to, to show a slide of what the current working programs are doing, not inconsistent at all with the kind of percentages you're seeing here. Lots of air sealing. That won't surprise anybody on the phone. Lots of duct leakage reduction. Also, no surprise, attic insulation. Then you get down into the heat pumps, replacing electric furnaces, a lot of those in the manufactured homes. That's an easy, easy fix, easy get. Uh, replacing older heat pumps, first generation, doing some floor insulation, and then a miscellaneous, miscellaneous other measures. Next slide, please. As we were doing all the work, we were predicting what our average savings would look like, what average projected costs would look like, what projected simple payback would look like. And then we tested the actual, and as you can see there on the right-hand side, the numbers were really close, which, is, uh, which was good. So simple payback of about a uh, little under seven years. These are 10-year loans, by the way, and why 10 years? Because Red Legs repayment, the money that has to get repaid to them is 10-year money. So that's why we tied it to the 10-year number. Next slide, please. Here's just sort of another representation of what the breakdown looks like for the member. Annual energy savings averaging in the pilot homes around $1,200 a year. Uh, about almost 900 of that being repaid in loan payments. And then the member putting in their pocket just under 300 bucks a year. So they're already saving enough to more than cover that the average home is saving enough to more than cover its loan payments and put money in, in the homeowner's pocket. Uh, and of course, once the loan is paid off in that 6.6 or .6, 7 years or whenever, all of the savings go in the homeowner's pocket. Next slide, please. And then here's a, a, a representation of the demand savings. We wanted to see what that looked like. And as you can see, it kind of tracks um, the, the, the savings and the, and the load shape. Um, the energy efficiency savings and the energy savings. Um, and this is without, by the way, any controls installed in these homes. We deliberately avoided putting uh, HVAC switches on and uh, water heater switches, those sorts of things, controls, because we wanted to see these measures work on their own. Next slide. And uh, yeah, you can go ahead and skip to this, because a year after we finished the last pilot home, we went back to these homeowners, let them live for 12 months in, in this newly weatherized home, and then asked them these questions. Are you satisfied with your co-op having participated in the program? And 96% of them said yes, uh, uh, either sat as satisfied or more. Next slide. Are you more comfortable? This is not something we can measure with a test, any test equipment. We just have to ask. And almost 90% of them said yes. Next slide. And what about your bills, we said? Are you more or less satisfied? Remember, it's not just the electric bill now. It's the electric bill plus a loan payment. And again, almost 90% said yes. Next slide. And then we'll show you a member or a, a couple, Terry and John Norsworthy, who are served by Santee Electric. and uh, Their home is in Somerton, South Carolina. It's a sort of typical ranch home on a pond on a, on a small lake. 
Um, they are both retired, so they're on fixed income. They're, they're not um, uh, underprivileged folks, but they're on fixed income, so they appreciate any savings they can get. And if you would uh, click the next button there, Mark, you'll get to see what they're saving on a monthly basis. According to them, about $150 to $200 savings in their pocket or lower electric bills each month than what they experienced before we came. So very gratifying to see it make that kind of impact for the Norsworthys. Next slide, please. Some conclusions we drew from our pilot. Uh, again, the average home dropped energy use by about 34%, about 11,000 kWh a year. You saw the savings earlier on that slide. Coincident peak savings represented on the slide that I showed you a moment ago uh, dropped about a third. Load factor unchanged again because of the, the lack of switches in this particular program. But more comfort, more satisfaction from members, very important component of what we did. And of course, spawned the, uh, we, this pilot spawned some ongoing programs. Next slide, please. So it was very important to, for us to consider the business case for doing this uh, because, again, I mentioned at the outset, we're long on power in South Carolina. The economy is not too great here still, like for most of y'all. Sales are flat or even negative in some co-ops. Um, uh, so what's the business case? Well, here, here you go. Short term, participant member satisfaction positive, load factor impacts minimal. I will also say, according to the co-ops, revenue impacts small, even for a long term, more, much more aggressive program. Speaking of long term, there you see, why would you do something like this? Well, EPA's told us, and I'm sure many of y'all, in their 111 the proposed rules, uh, energy efficiency is going to have to be part of your state implementation plan. We don't know to what degree, but we do know South Carolina is um, one of the top states in the union in terms of EPA's expectations for uh, carbon reductions. Um, energy efficiency is cheaper than new generation, likely less than two cents a kilowatt hour in our estimation. And of course, there are broader economic benefits, and, and co-ops are all about these. It, may, it creates jobs. Uh, business for, for local folks and the supply chain. Next slide, please. And I do want to talk to you a little bit about those working programs and then before I hand it off, uh, here, here they are. Um, Aiken Electric was the first out of the gate after the pilot ended. They are now on their third $1 million red leg loan, rural economic development loan from USDA, RUS, uh, and going gangbusters. And by the way, none of these folks on this list is doing any um, broad marketing of its programs. This is totally word of mouth. And that won't surprise you guys either on the phone. But uh, there you go. The, the asterisks, let me explain those. Little River Electric, Lynch's River Electric, brand new to the fold. Haven't done any houses yet, for, but will soon. York Electric, the asterisk next to them, uh, they did a 10-home pilot in 2014 of their own version of a Help My House program to test all the measures I've listed for you previously. HVAC, insulation, uh, duct sealing, air sealing, in tandem with HVAC air conditioning controls. Uh, and so that was just kind of a test pilot that they did. Uh, next slide, please. And I do want to talk about a little bit more about this. Uh, I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to talk some more as well. Uh, Mark mentioned it at the outset. I have the privilege of working with EESI uh, to, to help support their OBA on the financing efforts across the country. Here's some of the assistance that anyone on this call, anyone uh, interested in, in an on-bill financing program can, can get from EESI, some of the support. You get experience from a lot of other people. You get, um, uh, they can help you assess whether it's a good fit, on-bill financing is a good fit for you, help you with resources, help design your program, uh, talk to you about funding. All of those things there. So I would encourage anyone on the, the line who's interested, there are the contacts bottom left of your screen, John Michael Cross, Miguel Yanez, and uh, encourage you to, to reach out to them as well. And with that, I'll, I'll hand it off uh, back to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Again, that was Lindsay Smith with the Electric Cooperative of South Carolina, and his contact information is right up there, and uh, I'll, I'll put that back up at the end of the presentation. I did want to uh, let everyone know we're getting a lot of really great questions. Um, what I'd like to do is um, get through uh, these three presentations, and then I will read back 
of those questions uh, to our presenters at the very end. So thank you for your patience there, and keep the questions rolling into the uh, questions box. So next up, uh, we have uh, Bob Dickey, who's the Vice President of Marketing and Economic Development with the Eastern Illini Electric Cooperative. Bob is um, uh, in Paxton, Illinois, where he has had the privilege of working uh, with Eastern Illini since January of 1998. The primary responsibilities of the marketing department are to increase off-peak kilowatt sales, to encourage economic development, educate members, organizations, and students on the cooperative principles, uh, energy efficiency, and the importance of sealing and insulating the um, building envelope, in addition to the benefits of geothermal. So Bob grew up on a farm and worked full-time while attending college night classes at Sangamon State University in Springfield, Illinois, where he received a degree in marketing and economics. He's made several energy efficiency presentations at regional and national conferences, including one in our nation's capital before senators and their staffs. He is also a board member of the Geothermal Alliance of Illinois. So uh, Bob, welcome, and uh, thank you. Take it away. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's my privilege to be part of this uh, presentation here today. And uh, I'm going to look at it from a little bit different perspective as far as more of the nuts and the bolts of what makes a loan program work or not work. Uh, I came in here in 1998. We've had a loan program since uh, 1987, and it wasn't being used very effectively. But what happened was, as we did more and more geothermals, we now have over 1,200 geothermal systems on our lines, and that's representing over 10% of our total member base now. Uh, rebates were getting very, very expensive. And the board said, we can't do that because very few are getting the benefit, and all are paying for it. So they said, we're not going to do rebates anymore. So what we had to do is we had to pull out something else to help um, uh, increase our energy efficiency with our members uh, and uh, help lower their bills. And so what we did is we really started working on a, on a, in, uh, implementing a loan program, which we call the Energy Wise Home Loan Program. And a lot of it is, is uh, basically for energy efficiency upgrades, whether it be, ener uh, whether it be uh, insulation, uh, building envelope ceiling, duct ceiling, uh, but a lot of it is also with HVAC systems because we are rural and we have a lot of uh, propane in our area. And our lot of, many of our members are paying anywhere from $1,800 to $2,500 a year to heat their old farmhouses. And we want to do something better with that and help them do that. So geothermal was a natural, but it's expensive. And uh, so what we're trying to do is we're, we're just trying to help our member lower their energy bills. So when we say energy, we're not just, we're, we're, whether it's electricity or gas, if we can help them lower it through energy efficiency, we will. One of the last things we don't we want to do is uh, encourage them to use electric resistance. Uh, we just don't think that's the smartest thing to do when there's other options like geothermal and air source heat pumps. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're, we've been doing is we've been promoting this energy efficiency for uh, for over 50 years. It was amazing. We got ready to do our 75th anniversary, so I was looking at some older uh, documentation that we had available to our members, and we had a member handbook. And I was amazed that back in 1948, we we're talking about the very same things on energy efficiency that we have been talking about here in the in the 21st century. Uh, that the the problem was why is it that we're not seeing more of it done? So what we discovered uh, was that many of uh, our members knew what they needed to do but they just didn't have the uh, financial capital of, available to, to, uh, to make it happen. So we, start, we actually started promoting our, uh, back in the early 2000, uh, we started promoting our uh, loan program. And as, as of now, we've loaned out to our members over two and a quarter million dollars uh, for energy efficiency improvements. And, and the average loan, because it's geothermal, it's, many of those are geothermal uh, uh, on top of uh, insulation, the average is about $7,200. We're very careful about who sees this information from our members when it comes to their financials. So there's three of us on a, on a uh, committee. I look at it first as the VP of Marketing and Economic Development, and I take it to the CFO. He checks it over, and then we have the CEO sign off on it. Uh, if any one of us three do not agree with, with what we see there and say this may be a, a risk as far as uh, being paid back, we will not uh, uh, loan the money. Many times, though, what we'll do is our goal is to help the member. Uh, maybe there's not a, they didn't supply us with enough information. So what we'll actually do is go back to them and talk to them a little bit about some, some other ways that maybe we can make this work. 
So far, out of that one, two and a quarter million dollars, we've had uh, only less than fifteen thousand dollars of bad debt. And I hate to say this, but uh, ten thousand of it was in one loan, and that's because we loaned money to somebody and didn't follow up to see where where they put it, and they didn't put it where they were supposed to, and then they disappeared. So that changed a lot of things that we did as far as uh, monitoring our loans. Next slide, please. Our loan requirements, uh, first of all, there's basically some, app, some forms that uh, the uh, member needs to fill out. So uh, what we see is, and we'll see actually a copy of this before, uh, before my presentation's over, but uh, we, we definitely want to have them fill out an application, and it's fairly uh, comprehensive, and we want them to supply us with an invoice, a uh, copy of an invoice, or at least a bid with the knowing that uh, before they get the money that this is going to happen. Um, we also do look at their credit worthiness. We do the online utility services uh, program, which many of our uh, cooperatives use for uh, here in Illinois. I don't know about across the country, but here in Illinois, to uh, check out whether or not the member needs to pay a deposit when they become a member. So we use those same services, but I do look at, at more of uh, their credit history than just that. Well, we used to loan up to 100% of the money. Uh, we, our loans at one time were, up to, were only $10,000 at max at seven years. And uh, we determined now that if we're going to do some of these, uh, we've pretty well covered the members that can do what they can do with $10,000. We have now increased it to $20,000, but our board of directors said we want them to have some skin in the game. So the ma maximum loan is $20,000 with, uh, with the member uh, pitching in at 20% 20, uh, 20 of that loan uh, themselves. So if, if it's over $3,000, we do require a, a security agreement that they sign, and it, we also have a UCC form. Now, um, if the loan is more than five years, and we have loans that now go from five years to 10 years, the UCC form only lasts for uh, five years, so at, in, if it's a 10-year loan agreement, then basically we've got to go back and we've got to refile that UCC form. But doing that UCC lien form uh, has helped us several times where members got ready to sell their house and they hadn't paid off the loan yet, and we got called and said, hey, you know, they, they even forgot about the fact that uh, <laughs> they uh, had signed that, and uh, we were able to take care of that, and, and um, that's why we don't have the bad debt. So interest we look at on an uh, uh, annual basis. It's based upon whatever the co-op is paying at the, for that year, and that's what we our member as far as loan. Let's, next slide, please. Loans can range anywhere between five thousand and twenty thousand dollars. They can also range up from five years for a five thousand dollar loan, ten years for a saying, look, you're a part of a cooperative. There's a lot of membership here, and as a result, what you do affects the rest of our membership base, and this is why we have these precautions. And uh, if, you, if we were loaning money to someone else, would you, uh, would you uh, want us to do, uh, be very slack in what we're doing, or would you like these same kind of criteria for other members? And, and they all agree that uh, they have no problem doing what we've asked them to do. We've tried to make it, next slide, please. We've tried to make it as simple as possible. Uh, as far as applying for a loan, so that all they have to do is go to our uh, website, eic.coop website, and uh, click on energy efficiency. Uh, next slide, please. When they do that, there's a drop-down box and a tab, and one of them is a loan program. So we just basically on our uh, so if somebody wants to know about our loan, they call in, talk to our member care representatives or anybody else. We can easily direct them to our website. And uh, if you notice in the upper right-hand corner, it says Downloads, Loan Information, and Application. That's our next slide we're looking at here right now. So there's actually just two pieces of paper or forms that you look at. Uh, we used to mail these out to everybody, and, and, it, and it really dragged out the, uh, the process. By going to our website now, we can help someone immediately. They can go onto our, uh, our website, download these, fill them out, scan them, and, I've, and most everything I'm getting back now is all electronic. 
Uh, but these are the two forms they're going to fill out, and I'm going to end up and compare them later, uh, later on when I get them back. Next slide, please. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some internal documentation and tracking. And so I'm going to take the information that we're asking, and I'm going to put it on this form. It's an electronic form as well, but I've got one for each of our members who have now applied for a loan. We just we implemented this about uh, 10 years ago, and that uh, helps us track better uh, what our, where our loans are at and, and uh, gives a better feel for the, the amount of loan we're loaning and uh, why we're loaning it. So let's go to the next slide, please. So some of the things we're going to ask for is we want to be sure that the application is completed, that we ask for a processing fee. That processing fee is $50. Uh, we, we compare the credit report with the information they provide us on this application. We also look at accounts receivable with that member over the past 36 months, see if there's any uh, late pays. Uh, we obviously have a, a copy of the contractor's quote on the file. We have a copy of the credit report. It's, a simple, it's very simple to do. Uh, it takes me about 10 minutes uh, to get a credit report and, uh, and maybe another uh, 20 minutes to actually take a look at how the application they filled out as far as their loans and, and their uh, outstanding debt compares with the credit report. Uh, we have asked them for proof of an income now, and usually it is a pay stub because sometimes what happens is they'll tell us they got this, they make this big uh, amount of money as far as their, uh, how much income they have, but what they don't talk about is how much they owe. So we're, we're going to compare the pay stub with that. And, uh, and you know, we also asked them for the, the last year's federal income tax filing. We needed, uh, since we're going to find it, file a UCC form and a security agreement, we need a, their property tax ID number and a legal description of the property. We'll also uh, track the number of delinquent payments in the past 24 months. Next slide, please. This is a internal contact tracking. Uh, this, I, that, the form you just saw before, uh, in the information I asked, that is, it goes in the personal file, and that is only seen by myself, the CFO, and the CEO. But sometimes you know, somebody will call in and they'll want to know uh, where their loan at, is at in the process. So they may be talking to member services, they may be talking to member care representatives, anyone uh, that picks the phone up and, and talks to them. And what we've got with iView now through NISC, we've got what we call contact tracking. And uh, this is just one, one view of contact tracking, tracking that we use. But for example, there's, they can pull up the member, and we have, uh, in this top one here, we have reasons. And if you go down and look under the reasons, it's loan information. And there's a description, and there's a, there's a solution. But we then can go to a questionnaire. Next slide, please. And this questionnaire, uh, as we go through the process, we literally fill this out. So our member care representative, while they're on the phone, can say, well, uh, uh, your uh, loan has been approved, uh, and uh, basically the security agreement is on its way. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, sometimes they'll call back and they, they want to pay the loan off early, and there's no penalty for doing that. Uh, we'll let them know what the, what the total amount of payment is at that date. Uh, and, and then basically any, they, can, they can talk to anyone without them knowing the particulars of that particular loan and find out where it is at in the process. So, this is our process that you see here. And what we're finding is that this, is, this process is working very well. It's very simple. And we've had, we've had a lot of success with it now. And our members seem very satisfied with it. Our board of directors are definitely satisfied with it, um, and uh, especially since we haven't had any bad credit. And our members are seeing their utility bills lower dramatically when it comes to their energy bills uh, because they're, they're spending less on energy due to their energy efficiency upgrades and their uh, typically with the geothermal system that would have cost them somewhere in the neighborhood of $24,000, uh, they're seeing reduction in energy costs as much as uh, $1,800 a year because of geothermal. So we're again, we're just trying to support our member. We found this was better than rebates. We had to come up with something. And by the way, when we did end up in those rebates, this is when the, the loan program got to be even more, uh, uh, how shall I say, uh, energetic with our members as far as wanting to utilize it. So this is my portion of the presentation. Thank you very much, Bob. Really appreciate it. Uh, we are getting a, a lot of good questions uh, for everyone. And again, I'll, I'll read those out uh, once we get through uh, one more presentation here. And also, if anyone's experiencing a slight delay between audio and um, the, the visual that you see, uh, my apologies. Don't worry. The inter internet sometimes just seems to need an extra um, second or two to catch back up um, to the audio. 
Um, our uh, next speaker, next and uh, final speaker, is Brian Dryling, who is the manager of energy services with Midwest Energy. So Brian has worked in the energy use uh, related business for 36 years. He cur is currently the manager of energy services at Midwest Energy in Hayes, Kansas. Brian holds a Bachelor of Science degree in business management from Friends University. He's a certified ResNet energy rater, an EPA, EPA Energy Star provider, and a level three thermographer. Brian has extensive experience in utility demand side management programs, financing mechanisms, energy audits, thermal imaging, and building simulations. So thanks for joining us, uh, Brian, and take it away. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us today and uh, for the opportunity to, to, to brag a little bit on, on our program. Uh, first thing, uh, go ahead and then change slides. Uh, a little bit about uh, Midwest Energy and, and where we're located. Uh, obviously, we're in Kansas. Um, we're a little bit different than the, the average uh, cooperative. Uh, we are a combined gas and, and electric utility. I uh, have around 49,000 electric and around 42,000 gas customers. Um, out in uh, western Kansas where we, we live, uh, things are pretty sparse and we're spread out a long way. As you can see uh, the, the map there and, and we're on the, the, the whole western half and we're spread out of around 41 counties. So uh, things can take a while out here and, and our customers are far and few between, but uh, that's just kind of the way we like that. Go ahead and uh, switch slides, please. Um, we've been in the business a long time, just, just kind of like uh, Bob was mentioning earlier, and um, something we have found over, over about the 30 years of, of trying to do some energy efficiency programs, uh, there are three main things that, that we just have to have for our programs to work. Uh, one thing is, is we have to have really good energy analysis. Uh, we have to have good energy auditors, so they have to be, be able to perform all types of audits, whether it's lighting, infrared scans blower door duct testing, the whole gamut of things. Uh, it's nice to have um, the auditors that have some kind of credentials, whether it's resident or BPI and, and Energy Star certified, it's, it's nice to have that behind it. Um, we also realize that uh, the results of these things have to be based on reality, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's one of the keys. Also over the years we found out that if we don't have good installers, uh, things don't happen very well and we don't get the results we like. And the last but not least is the financing side, and that's really why we're here today. But um, over the past or over the years, we, we've tried to, tried to eliminate that financing sometimes from our energy efficiency programs, and we're finding out that we just don't have very good results without it. For instance, uh, this is our third generation. The House Smart is our third generation of our loan programs. So, but that's what we're going to talk to you about today. A little bit about House Smart. Uh, what is it? It's uh, it's not your average on bill financing that you would expect. It's a little bit different than that. It's it's based on a, on a pay system, pay as you save. Uh, not our not our uh, concept, but we, we did uh, use it from somebody else and uh, we modified it. it. Works pretty well. Um, we treat it as a little bit different. It's just not an energy efficiency uh, program. It's an investment, uh, kind of like they're doing in South Carolina. We we had to go through and we had some state uh, statutes changed that that actually treat this as a utility. This isn't a whole lot different than the wires and pipes uh, that we're getting loans for or installing anywhere else. So the House Smart has four key attributes. Uh, we'll kind of look at those in a little depth. Go ahead and, and flip it to the other slide for me, please. Um, you know, with no upfront capital is important. Um, ours is a little bit different than the average loan, though, because this is for the economically justified projects. Um, it is not unusual on our project that the savings does not always cover the total cost of the project. So we allow people to buy things down. If you go in and you need a new heating and cooling system and you already have, say, a gas system that's at 80% and you're only going to 90, um, you may not see that much savings, but you need a new one anyway because yours is bad. Um, we can still help on those projects, but we're only allowed to help the portion that is economically justified. And here again, we'll take a little bit look at that later also. Um, because of this, because we're, 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 we're restricted to the savings, the, the capital that we, we loan out has to be low cost. The lower it is, the more we can help, the better off we are. And we find capital anywhere we can get it. Uh, we've went through the state programs, we've went through the stimulus programs, 
and and we also use the red leg, the RUS funds. So um, it, it's flexible enough for that lets us go just about anywhere we can for the financing. Go ahead and switch slides for me, please. And uh, um, we talked a little bit earlier. Um, obviously, they are uh, they're paid for in your utility bill. I'm trying to yeah. Here we go. Um, they're on the utility bill. It's a fixed charge. Doesn't change. Our terms are a little bit longer than that than normal. We go up to 180 months on residential. Uh, a little bit shorter on commercial, and and we base this on about 75 expectancy of the measures. Our lighting uh, measures are only about for seven. The surge charges cover the project investment, the cost. The state allows us to add a five percent. Uh, Hidden slides, please. Savings um, and and how do we come up with the savings? Well, they we obviously do a, a an extensive energy audit, gather as much information as possible. Um, we 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 bring it back to uh, uh, actual history. What we have found is. The software packages out there have a tendency to overstate energy use and thus overstate the energy. Um, obviously, we still have the disconnection for non-payment because, after all, it is just another utility service, and, and we can treat it as such. One thing we do also it, to help us, especially when the set, the property changes hands, it sells, is we do file UCC filing. We did not do that from the very beginning uh, because it was always up to the the person who started the the, the house smart loan to to notify the next people. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't doing that, so we did start filing the UCC, um, which is basically a, a small lien on the property. So before it sells, we do get notification, and that way everybody's aware of, of, of where the you know, where the loan is. Go ahead and switch slides, please. Um, it should be on slide number nine. Um, and uh, the question here is, uh, well, we, we have some results. We've been doing this since 2007. Uh, 2007 was a small pilot. For us, but we've, we've expanded it uh, totally system-wide now. Since then, we've done 233 uh, conservation plans, uh, basically the audits. Uh, we've uh, completed, improved about half of those, actually a little over half of those. You can see we've invested $7.7 .7 million. Um, you know, the average project is around $5,800. to $800. Now, here's the, this is where it's interesting, though. The customers added to that $5,800 another 16 on average. So um, it, it's, here again, the, the customer has, it, has their teeth into it also. They have a little bit of stake in it to make it right also. 
Um, savings you can see pretty well. Um, you know, a lot of you know their energy, our, our, our terms of gas. They kind of put that in perspective a little bit. The um, the kilowatt hour saved per year is equal to about 270 houses on our system, and the gas savings is equal to about 460 houses total usage. Um, that combined together is around uh, uh, 4,800 tons of carbon emitted, or not emitted, but saved every year. So it, it has been a good program for us. Go ahead and make a quick switch for me, please. Um, as we look at this thing, it kind of gives us some averages. Um, you know, the, the house smart charge is, is, is not a whole a big charge. It's around $41 a month. You kind of see the savings is 49 it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but you got to remember they're paying everything back, and, and everything's a plus form. Uh, the new equipment's installed. Uh, they're saving a little bit of money, saving a lot of energy, and it's working out pretty well for us. Um, we do go back out every year, and we check these uh, as, as they roll through the year. We watch uh, to see how close we're getting, and um, we look at pre pre audit uh, use and then post audit use. And uh, we are very, very close to our projected numbers. Here again, we, we always calibrate our models back for that very purpose. And uh, we feel One reason is is because if the customer satisfaction, and I'll show you a little slide, you know, also be cut a little bit later, uh, but it is definitely up because of that. And right now, you know, the politically, it's pretty popular to have some kind of uh, energy conservation program, and uh, with the EPA rules. We were going to have to change it anyway and get into it. So go ahead and change slides for me, please. Should be on slide number 12 now. Um, what does this mean for the customer? You know, it, it eliminates that, that, that large sum of money they have to pay up front to make some kind of improvement. Uh, may not eliminate it totally, but it does take the bulk of it out of there. Um, it, uh, the split incentives are very, very nice. We talked about that earlier about the landlords splitting out The, one, the, the, the green bar is obviously the customers that have just um, just their general customers, and it shows that eh, they're they're fairly well satisfied, and, and and their value perception is not as good as we would like it. But by just doing the audits, and also doing the audits along with the financing, you can see the drastic change. Um, I mean, we are co-ops, and we always want to do what our customers want us to do. 
And this is a good indication of why we do the energy efficiency. Not only is it good for everybody, it's what our customers want us to do. Um, but I, you know, these charts, um, it's amazing when we could take a customer that is calling in about um, a high bill complaint. And then we can change their perception from 68% to 96% by just doing a program uh, like that. And that's, that's uh, it's a great feather in everybody's cap who are, who are doing the energy efficiency side of things. Uh, go ahead and change one more slide, please. Um, you know, we've had a lot of interest in, uh, in the HouseMart program. Uh, it was one of the first uh, voluntary phase programs around. We've been doing it since 97. A lot of inquiries from different uh, uh, regulatory commissions and places like that. And, and we've won a few, uh, a few awards in the past five or six years. Uh, we're really proud of this. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that uh, uh, our customers like, and, and uh, it, it, it's bringing us a lot of notification. Um, like to see it continue on and, and, and going to better. Better. I think that's uh, everything I have. Go ahead and hit the next slide, I believe. That uh, should be the last one. Should have my contact information up there. homes were foreclosed on. The uh, owner basically abandoned the home and mortgage and walked away. Uh, here's what happened in our state when that took place. The lender, and in, in both cases where it, it took place, it was the same lender, a, a large bank, uh, immediately has lawyers sue to vacate any other liens against the property so that they, the mortgage lender, the primary lender, get any money that comes out of the sale of that home first. They sued us. They sued KW Savings and the Help My House brand to get the loan, the notice of meter conservation charge removed. We've won those cases, though, in court by arguing that it's not a lien against the property, but rather it's a loan tied to the meter on the property. And uh, the, the, the courts have sided with us. So. Um, uh, in terms of risk management, that document and the way our program is constructed has served us well so far. We had one other instance I'll mention quickly where a homeowner actually vacated the home and then the home burned to the ground. That was a unique situation, obviously, for a number of reasons, including that, of course, the fire destroyed the equipment, insulation, all the work we had done. Uh, but we did not know that until two years later when a realtor managed to sell the property to a buyer and found the notice of meter conservation charge still intact at the registrar, so it became part of the closing documents, and the realtor called us and said, you know, what the heck is this? Uh, my buyer shouldn't have to pay a loan back for uh, equipment that no longer exists, and of course, on reflection, we had to agree. That's where it's important as on-bill financing programs to have a loan loss reserve for writing those things off. 
uh, which is what we did in that case. In the other two cases, all that happened was the loan went dormant for the time that the home was vacant after the foreclosures took place. And then when the homes are resold, the loan will either be cleared at closing by the buyer or seller, or the buyer of the home picks up the loan where it left off. And the only thing that the co-op is out is, of course, the interest. Uh, hope that answers at least part of that question. I think so, Lindsay. Uh, thank you. The next question is for Bob. Um, Bob, can you talk about what are some of the deal breaker issues that would keep uh, you or Eastern Illini from loaning? Well, uh, number one, uh, we we try to use 700 as, for an Empirica score as the as the baseline, but uh, if they haven't been truthful on filling out their application compared to their credit scores or to their their online credit use and what it shows outstanding as far as debt, uh, and and we and we try to make uh, how should I say we try to balance that or justify that with them, and, but if they if we just find that they're just not being forthcoming, and of course. Uh, if they if they definitely have had uh, how shall I say uh, if they haven't paid their bill to us on on a uh, timely basis over the past uh, 36 months those are those are basically deal breakers. There are some times though where uh, we bend over backwards because we see that this this member it could have been for example they they maybe even had a bankruptcy and a lot of times. If it's medical, it, you know, it was out of their control. The bills ran up. There's nothing they could do about it, and they need help. And we will we will figure out a way to help them. And and I'm not saying that happens very often, but we have never been burnt on anything like that when we've done it. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Brian, um, can you talk a little bit about how how do you communicate monthly savings and and benefits um, to customers? Uh, in the in the program or on the bill. Well, the the initial savings are, are laid out in what we call our conservation plan, and uh, these are the options that we give our customers, uh, whether they're they're replacing heating and cooling and and um, or insulation the envelope improvements. So the, the savings are generated up front, um, and, and the reports are all generated up front. Um, on the bill, all they really see is the. Uh, is the, the itemized uh, charge for the loan, um, and uh, you know, like I said, we we check them all to make sure that we actually see the savings we are, and we'll we're seeing pretty well everything we say we we, we want to see, except uh, there might be a few occasions where somebody does something different. They will, you know, after the audit, they they may start up a business in their garage, and and all of a sudden their energy use does something strange. But but for the most part, we're right on with it, what we what we say we're going to say. Yeah. This is a uh, question for any of the three panelists. Um, have, have you encountered resistance from co-op boards that do not want to access federal funding for philosophical or ideological reasons? And if so, what do you think is the best way to approach that? I'll speak for the Eastern Line Electric Cooperative. Uh, we bought out when our, our cooperative was a merger of two cooperatives here in East Central Illinois in 1986. And uh, they, uh, this the new uh, cooperative bought out of our, the RUS program, and as as such, we have been doing everything on our own because uh, basically we're uh, we're self financed, and uh, and that's the way the board basically wants to wants to keep it. So it it's just, I mean, I guess it's the mentality of the board, and that that could easily change as we get different board members. But at this point, that's what it is. You know, at Midwest Energy, we um, we would probably accept any types of funding we could get, um, as as long as the the restrictions aren't aren't, aren't too prohibitive. Um, and sometimes with the RUS funding and things like that, the the the, the red tape can be pretty uh, pretty stringent. So, uh, you know, but our board would probably allow allow it to get it from any way we could, as long as it didn't affect anything else. And uh, just quickly, this is Lindsay in South Carolina. The, the co-ops that are running our program, a, a, a couple of them have chosen not to access that, that federal funding. They are using their own operating money and running the program at a very small scale. So there are a lot of different ways you can fund your, your lending pool. They don't necessarily have to be what I've talked about earlier with the uh, red leg loans. Thank you. And uh, Lindsay, another question for you. Um, could you quickly provide the details on the financing, like loan maturity 
interest rate, um, the percent of energy efficiency project costs that were covered, and also, um, did you have to comply with lending regulations, or did the credit union provide that service, or did the tariff structure eliminate that requirement? Oh, let me answer the last question first. The, the tariff structure and the, the law, the 2010 law, uh, eliminated that requirement. Uh, yeah. But it did put in place certain provisions by which we have to abide in order to maintain that protection, including um, capping the interest rate we can charge to consumers at 4%. Uh, so if, if you get red leg money, you're getting that at 0% from the federal government. You're lending that out at 4 or in the case of at least one of our co-ops, less than that, 375 uh, One of our co-ops, by the way, elected to charge 5%. Um, just that was their preference, and they knew by so doing they were outside of the statute, which means they do not have the right to disconnect for non-payment of the loans, but they have. They are still a Help My House co-op. They had their business plan approved. They're still operating everything else that I described in, earlier in my presentation. Um, does, did I get all of, hit all of the questions there, Mark, or did I leave something out? I think so. I think so. Thank right. you. Right. Um, here's a, a question again generally for uh, all three panelists. Um, it, we, we've sort of, everyone's touched on this just a little bit, but it's focused on the problems with selling homes to which loans are attached. Um, and the, the, the asker uh, brings up the, um, the fact that there have been areas of the country where lease solar arrays have been, um, homes with uh, lease solar arrays have been more difficult to sell uh, in some markets. Does anyone have a, uh, want to continue talking about that? Well, but in, in Kansas, we, we have that issue a little bit with the loan program. Um, I'm not so sure they're harder to sell as long as you disclose it up front and, and the pr prospective buyer knows, uh, you know, how the program works. Um, but we've had a few instances where the, the house is sold and they didn't quite understand that they were going to pay for that, that, that new system after they bought the house, and, and so they... They usually go back to some kind of negotiations uh, with the seller, and they work that out. So, and and it, you had a question earlier about about what percentage of these loans continue on with the new owner. Um, ours are about 80% of these go on to the new owner, and about 20% pay them off at closing. So the new owners seem to be pretty receptive of the, this type of program. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Bob. Uh, does the Illinois program really have an adjustable interest rate? Uh, the cost of borrowing change over time, but still, how um, how come uh, there's no fixed interest rate? Well, it, first of all, it, this is Eastern Illinois Electric Cooperative's own program, and uh, it's we uh, we've had several discussions with the statewide association to make sure that we're within the legal format of uh, uh, requirements of the state of Illinois, and we are. So again, it's we're using our basically our own money, and and we, again we we uh, adjust the interest rate if necessary based upon what we're borrowing on an annual basis. Now it, it doesn't affect any other. And once there is a loan with a member, that that rate is fixed. But it's if uh, it's all new loans, and if I wasn't clear on that, I apologize for that because it is each year any new loan if there's a change in the in in the interest rate, that's when it happens for the new loans. Thank you. Um, Lindsay, can you please briefly explain again why no load control switches were part of the program? Yeah, I mentioned earlier that the folks who put our Help My House pilot together at Central Electric and um, the folks here at Statewide uh, wanted to see these weatherization measures operate without any controls on them to see what kind of impact that would have on the energy use in the home and also um, against peak uh, without any kind of controls. And by controlling them, you'd be, you'd be monkeying with that some. So it was a deliberate decision not to do them at that time. I will say that the working programs, a number of them, have determined to, do, uh, to, to install switches as they go. I mentioned earlier Aiken Electric was one of the first to start its own program after the pilot ended. They've been very deliberate about every home that participates goes through their water heater control program. And uh, so every one of them gets a switch. Uh, again, as an ongoing thing, we definitely recommend to anybody considering running one of these programs, why would you not do that if, uh, 
if you have an opportunity to be in the home, it may be a one-off. You might as well do that while you can. Thank you. And uh, I, I know, just for the record, I know we're over time, but uh, we still have a lot of people listening in. And uh, so a couple more questions to go through. So thanks to our speakers for sticking around just a couple more minutes. Um, uh, we've been getting a couple questions about dormancy uh, or in, in vacancy of a home. Um, one, one specific question was, uh, you know, since the loan is tied to the meter, what happens to if a home becomes vacant for an extended period of time? Um, also, does the does interest continue to accrue during periods of dormancy? Um, so, does anyone want to address uh, these questions? Um, in in our program in Kansas. Uh, the interest does not accrue while it is, is being vacant, um, but it does extend the the, the loan life, obviously, um, until it's it's you know reoccupied again. The Lynn, same Lindsay, with South Carolina. Okay. okay. Um, what is the name of uh, so n neither South Carolina or can nor Kansas have pace legislation. But both states allowed financing through the meter. Um, what is the name of this kind of legislation? Um, you know, I'm not so sure I have a name. I have a, I mean, it was just an energy efficiency uh, uh, statute that was, was introduced in, in Kansas in 2007, and I have the, the number, but I'm not sure if it actually had a particular name. Lindsay, did you see anything like that? Uh, same here, same here. We we didn't have a particular name for it, but Mark, if it would be helpful to you and the folks on the webinar, uh, I can certainly send you a copy of our state statute, and if you wanted to distribute that with the slides, you're welcome to do that. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'd do that, and I would uh, certainly distribute that to everyone. Um, so um, one, one person, I, Lindsay, you may have covered this, but my apologies if you did. Uh, we have one question. Someone asking whether um, retrofits in manufactured housing, if there's issues with HUD code there. None that I'm aware of. Um, uh, there are issues, and, and uh, the, the person asking the question may, may know all this stuff already, so I apologize. But there are issues, of course, with standards. The standards, as with, uh, as with building codes over time, have, have changed fairly dramatically. So th there are cutoffs. Uh, I believe 1990 is one of them, and then there's a cutoff some years prior to that where the building standards for manufactured housing were significantly different to the point that we had uh, serious reservations and continue to about retrofitting mobile homes of a certain age. Um, I'm not familiar with any HUD requirements about what you can and cannot do, but obviously our visual inspections are what guide us. Uh, what kind of home is the condition in? And I'm sure uh, many of you have come up on mobile and site-built homes that you know the media, that immediately when you roll up in the driveway that this is not a home you're going to be able to help, that it'd probably be better if they just had a new home. And we're not in that business, unfortunately. But, but we can make and have learned we can make significant differences for people in manufactured housing. Believe it or not, even putting insulation in the attic uh, or what passes for an attic, uh, in the space between the, the roof and, and the interior of the home. Uh, there's a lot you can do. The, the, the biggest step, though, and I mentioned this during my presentation, is to get that resistance heating, that uh, electric furnace, out of the home and put a heat pump in its place. You can make such a tremendous savings. And we have a lot of double wides here. That's an automatic for us. Thank you very much. And the last question that uh, we've received is actually a couple people were asking about um, the Red Legs acronym um, that, that y'all were using. And if you, if someone wouldn't mind kind of explaining um, what that is and, and kind of advice for working uh, with Red Legs. Well, I, I talked about that a good bit. So uh, this is Lindsay in South Carolina. The rural. Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program. Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program from USDA and RUS. Uh, if you're an RUS borrower, you're eligible to apply for that. These loans have been used for years and years and years by co-ops to, to do, as the name implies, economic development to build um, or help people in their communities build businesses, hotels, um, industrial parks, those kinds of things to draw industry and commercial businesses into their, their communities. 
uh, to create jobs and so forth. Uh, we had worked with USDA and RUS before we launched our pilot to change the rules to allow us to do what we're doing with the money, which is using that third party to lend it out as microloans to, to, uh, to help this weatherization effort, so rural weatherization, residential in our case. Um, but I'd encourage you just to Google uh, USDA, RUS, R-E-D-L-G, red leg, and uh, I'm sure Google will pop up lots of links to their website, and you can read more about how all that works and look into it and get more details. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, that was all the questions that were sent in. Do any of our speakers have any final thoughts they'd like to share uh, with the audience? We still have about 50 people on the, uh, on the webinar. OK. Well, with that, I'd like to thank our three speakers for your excellent presentations and for staying after uh, longer than an hour to answer all these really good questions that were sent in. That was Lindsay Smith. Uh, the Vice President of Education with the Electric Cooperative of South Carolina, Brian Dryling, the Manager of Energy Services with Midwest Energy in Hayes, Kansas, and Bob Dickey, Vice President of Marketing and Economic Development at Eastern Illini Electric Cooperative in Paxton, Illinois. Thank you uh, to our speakers and thank you to our attendees. You will receive a recording of this presentation as well as the slides, as well as any other documents that we discussed uh, that the speakers will pass through me. I'll then pass to you. So this is uh, Mark Milby at the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. And in partnership with, uh, we'd like to thank EESI uh, in DC for helping us out with this. Thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.